Hi guys, I'm Alex. I'm Veronica. I'm Isaac. And I'm Caitlin. We're the Good Tears family. Welcome to church. We're happy to have you join us for Every Nation online church service. But before we start, we want to remind you that we can still stay connected. We have virtual connect groups, weekly prayer calls, and other ways to stay connected. For more details, please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Now let's settle down and prepare our hearts for worship and service.
Hey, good morning, every nation, New Jersey. God bless you. PA here, Pastor Adam Burt, and I'm so excited you would spend your Sunday morning here with us. And so uh, it is October 31st, so I'm going to wish you a happy Halloween if I'm allowed to do that. If not, I wish you a happy trunk or treat or a happy harvest festival wherever you're at. Wherever you're at this morning, I just pray you're happy and I pray that you get to get together with good friends and, and maybe eat some, some candy today that you're not supposed to. And might I recommend to you the Kit Kat bar? It's tremendous. Uh, if some of you, perhaps your, your palate's a little bit more refined, you like the subtle pleasures of possibly a Hershey kiss. But what I do want to make clear this morning that if any of you like the disgusting, uh, almond joy bar, uh, I don't think you could be a part of our church. All right. <laughs> so anyways, uh, maybe that's not true, but uh, I guess we can be even almond joy. People can be reconciled in Christ Jesus. But uh, but I think you're crazy. Uh, anyways, let's get into our text this morning. We're going to be in Matthew uh, chapter 17. Uh, before we do that, uh, I want to frame up uh, something as we normally do with with a story. And maybe it's not a story, but it's it's actually a movie. And if you remember in 1997, some of us, we have to think way back in 1997, the world was introduced uh, to these two uh, young uh, actors, screenwriters uh, out of Boston, Massachusetts. And their name were, was uh, Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. And if you've seen the movie Goodwill Hunting, uh, where Matt Damon, he plays uh, Will Hunting, uh, a, a savant, a genius, Right. And, uh, in it though, he's, he has this abusive past. And so what he does is he just, he uses his genius as a way to armor and protect himself from ever uh, having intimate moments, deep friendships and relationships. And so, um, uh, so Robin Williams character, he plays this psychologist, psychiatrist who's there to, to try and disarm Will Hunting that he might fully tap in, uh, to his genius and, I say that because there's this classic scene where where um, Robin Williams is sitting down and he's trying to dismantle uh, uh, Matt Damon. And, and as he does, it's funny, Damon is telling about this, his new love interest. He met this girl and he's in his Boston accent. He's like, she's perfect. She's just perfect. Yeah. You know, but but then he determines I'm not going to see her anymore uh, because I'm sure the more I get to know, him, know her, the less perfect she'll be. And then Robin Williams immediately turns it back on him and he says, uh, or could it be that she'll find out that you're not perfect? See, what a horrible way to live life by only staying on the surface with people and, and never being known or fully known. But then I love it as the, the tension cre- uh, starts. Uh, then I, I love Robin Williams. He just totally downshifts into this random statement. And he says, he says, you know, my, my wife, uh, she would fart when she gets nervous. And all of a sudden, Matt Damon's like, what? And and then he starts giggling. And he's like, yeah. He goes, one night, she did it in her sleep. She woke the dog up. Ha <laughs> ha. And these two men just are, are laughing hysterically. And, and then suddenly, Robin Williams, he cuts through the laughter. And he says this. He says, yeah, it's crazy. Will, she's been, she's been dead for two years now. And those are the things that I remember about her. And then he says this. Those little idiosyncrasies that, that I... And only I knew. See, it, it was that thing that made me her husband. And, and so you could see, uh, that, that Robin Williams was beginning to break down, uh, uh, the defenses, the walls, the armor, uh, of Matt Damon. And so Matt Damon, he immediately, he'll, he downshifts and, and he, he begins to like verbally, uh, attack, uh, Robin Williams. And as he does, they, they actually get to this, this iconic scene where it's actually a showdown at a park bench. Uh, in a park and, and normally I would show it to you, but there's just like too many curse words for us here this morning. Goodness sake, I already said fart, uh, on the TV broadcast here, but, um, I thought I would read, uh, for you the script because I think it's powerful. Uh, and it's, it's this, the basic premise is this, that, that Will, you know a lot of stuff and yet you know absolutely nothing. And the scene goes like this, that, that, uh, Robin Williams, he says this. So if I asked you about art, You'd probably give me the skinny on every art book ever written. Michelangelo, you know a lot about him. Life's work, political aspirations, him and the Pope, sexual orientation, the whole works, right? But I bet you can't tell me what it smells like in the Sistine Chapel. You've never actually stood there and looked up at that beautiful ceiling. Seen that. If I asked you about women, you'd probably give me a syllabus of your personal favorites. You may have even uh, been with a few uh, a few women. He says, but you can't tell me what it feels like 
to wake up next to a woman and feel truly happy. He says, you're a tough kid. I ask you about war and you'd probably uh, throw Shakespeare at me, right? Uh, Once more into the breach, dear friends. But you've never been near one. You've never laid your best friend's head in your lap and watched him gasp his last breath looking to you for help. And if I asked you about love, you'd probably quote me a sonnet, but you've never looked at a woman and been totally vulnerable. You've never known someone uh, uh, that could level you with her eyes, feeling like God put an angel on earth just for you. Who could rescue her from the depths of hell? And you wouldn't know what it's like to be her angel and to have that love for her to be there forever through anything, through cancer. He says, you wouldn't know about sleeping, sitting up in the hospital room for two months, holding her hand because the doctors could see it in your eyes that the term visiting hours don't apply to you. You don't know about real loss because that only occurs when you love something more than you love yourself. I doubt you've ever dared to love anybody that much. I look at you. I don't see an intelligent, confident man. I see a cocky, scared kid. But you're a genius, Will. No one denies that. No one could possibly understand the depths of you. But you presume to know everything about me because you saw a painting of mine and you ripped my life apart? He says, you're an orphan, orphan, right? Do you think I'd know the first thing about how hard your life has been? How you feel? Who you are? Because I read Oliver Twist? Does that encapsulate you? Personally, I don't give a darn about that because you know what? I can't learn anything from you I can't read in some book unless you want to talk about you, who you are. And I'm fascinated. He says, I'm in. But you don't want to do that, do you, sport? You're terrified of what you might say. It's your move, chief. And and the, the, the scene ends. And I say that to say this is I've been a pastor long enough to see that that much like will hunting, that, that I see that, that people tend to armor up and, and they're afraid of intimacy and deep relationship with Jesus Christ. They, there's so many reasons why people uh, armor up. And here'd be one, like people armor up because like inside you're terrified that God will reject you. And so you reject him before he has the opportunity to reject you. And I just want to tell you, man, have you ever read the Bible? I mean, the Bible, all it is, is filled with rejects. I mean, we're going to read a story today uh, about uh, uh, Moses. Did you know that Moses, he killed the man and has anger issues? He's a reject. Um, that we're going to see today that, that, that there's intimacy with, with Peter. Do you know that Peter is, is just some cussing sailor um, uh, that's going to deny Jesus three times? Uh, James and John will be in our text today. But you know, James and John were just, they were the power hungry young kids who, who had this constant argument of who's the greatest, right? And so rejects, listen, we're all rejects. And, and yet God longs for intimacy with rejects. Um, how about some of you are going to armor up, um, and you just want to keep it on the surface with God, right? Like, like, you know, those relationships where, where you don't want to go deep with people. So you just talk about sports or the weather. And I mean, I see so many people do that with God because, because you're afraid, because you're afraid to go deep with God, to commit to Him, because you're terrified of what He might ask of you or ask from you. You're terrified of it. And so what? You armor up. You keep it on the surface. And I know there's some people that, uh, that you armor up, uh, through distractions and excuses, right? You just, just want people to just look at all these other things so you don't have to pay attention to the real thing, which is your relationship with Jesus Christ. And so, so what you'll do is you'll just point to, ah, yeah, but, uh, but the, the church, you know, they did this or so and so is a hypocrite or, or this pastor cheated on his wife. And you'll point to all these different distractions to avoid the main question. And here's the main question. Uh, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Because listen, at the, at the end of time, man, there's going to be this giant, the sound of this, this deafening trumpet and the skies rip open and, and all your excuses and distractions are going to melt away and it's going to be you and the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and are you going to hear these words? Hey, depart from me. I don't know you. Or will you hear these words? Welcome home. It's your move, chief.
And so now let's be in our text here, Matthew chapter, uh, we're actually going to start at the end of 16, uh, and then move into 17, uh, verse 8. And so, so starting in Matthew 16, verse 28, I'll read it to you. It says this, um, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the son of man coming in his kingdom. And so now we're going to see that some of the, we're going to see a glimpse of the kingdom of God and some of the disciples are going to get to see this. Uh, verse 1 of chapter 17, And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain. Uh, for the record, many theologians think this is Mount Hermon. It's some 10,000 feet high, and so it, it's going to take effort to get to the high places uh, with Jesus. Uh, the atmosphere is thin, and it can be tiring, but you want to get to the high places with Jesus. Uh, verse 2, it says, uh, And he was transfigured before them. It means he metamorphosized. Uh, and it says his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. He's, he's giving uh, these men a, a glimpse into his divinity, his divinity. And he peels back his humanity. It says this um, in verse three, and behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with them. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. I got to stop a minute and just say that like this is so Christian uh, of Peter to do. Like like sometimes when you have this this sweet spot with the Lord and what is he saying? Hey, let's just build a tent. We'll just stay up here on this mountain. It'll just we be we four and no more, right? And and while the while the, uh, all the earth uh below them and a sinful dying world burns to the ground. Man, man, God's called you to, to the high places that he might release you on mission to go save a dying and hurting world. Or I, I, I also, I need to highlight this is Peter says, hey, let's make three tents, one for Moses, Elijah, and you, Jesus, as if they're all on the same level. Well, I got news for you. God the Father's about to speak, and he's like, nope, they're not on the same level. Uh, let's continue. Verse five, verse 5, it says, he was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from that cloud said this, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And so um, uh, let's, let's kind of break down this, this text here in these, these passages. And notice that Peter, James, and John went to the high places with Jesus. And, and listen, here's, here's what I think is, is so important. Like, it's always Peter, James, and John. And, and here's the reason why. It's because they laid down their yes. So um, it's funny, um, um, Robin Williams in, in the scene, he references the Sistine Chapel. And if you've ever seen this, this tremendous work of art by Michelangelo, you know that there's one scene, it's called The Creation of Adam, and I, and I think we have a, uh, um, we'll have a, a slide of it, and it's this, this epic painting, and where God is, with all this effort, He's reaching out to Adam, His creation, and Adam, just indifferent, lazy, all He has to do is, is just, bro, just move an inch, just move an inch, and you'll be connected to your Creator, yet He seems too lazy, too indifferent to do it, and, and I feel like that's many of us. That God has, 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 he's gone 99% of the way. He sent his son because he loved you. Jesus went to the cross, all this. And now can you just reach out? Can you just lay down your yes to Jesus? Like these three men, Peter, James, and John, they just laid down their yes. Whatever you want, Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. And because they laid down their yes, they got to have these unbelievably intimate moments with the Lord. Like, like none of the other disciples got to see them raise Jairus' daughter, daughter, little girl, I say to you, arise. And this girl rises from the dead. That, that they get to see this high point with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. This high, high, but as well, Peter, James, and John, they get to see Jesus at his lowest point in the Garden of Gethsemane as he sweat drops of blood and he, and he felt like he could die at any moment. And so, so have you laid down your let yes for Jesus? Have you laid down your yes, whatever you say, Lord, because God, he's calling us up higher. He's calling us up Mount Hermon to the, to the high places, because if you can get to the high places with Jesus, 
it will absolutely transform your life. It'll make you new again. And so, uh, um, we, we've talked about this before, but, but the eagle is a fascinating bird. Like, do you know that, that's, that eagles have been known to live up to 70 years? And, and yet there, there comes this moment between the ages of 35 and 40, and, and the eagle has aged. And, and now uh, his beak has become brittle, that his talons are overgrown and his feathers begin to mat. And he has this decision. What is he going to do? And so this eagle, he'll fly up to the high places and, and snuggle in to, to a cleft in the high place. And in that high place, he'll begin to tear out his old talons. It's unbelievably painful. And then he'll begin to rip out his old matted feathers until finally the, the eagle will break off his beak. And there, just naked, that thing, he, he will sit in the cleft of the rock in the high places for months until what happens? New growth. And suddenly, um, after several months of waiting in the high places, this eagle will come out almost like a brand new eagle. And it can live another 30 years after that. And, and now, do you understand when the psalmist in Psalm 103, verse 5, uh, the psalmist says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Man, God is calling you to the high places with him to renew your strength and your youth in God. And so uh, here's the, the second observation from our text is this. Do you know, um, it, it's, it's our turn, our turn in the story. It's our turn in the story uh, of Almighty God. And so, so we read about Moses and Elijah. Uh, this, that would stand for that, that he was, uh, Moses and Elijah is, is the law and the prophets. And so, in other words, it's your Old Testament in your scriptures. And, and yet, um, the, the, the story, uh, the Old Testament, it's only the beginning of the story. And all of it is pointing to Jesus. And so we get this moment with, with Moses and Elijah pointing to Jesus. And, and now we get to Jesus, we see that, that the law is fulfilled perfectly in Jesus, that the prophecies are fulfilled, uh, in Jesus. And, and listen, so Jesus is kind of the point at which, uh, time is measured and time turns. It's, it's why we have BC before Christ or, or AD, Anonis Domini. But, but do you know what? I, I don't think AD should mean Anno Domini, uh, year of our Lord. Here's what I think it should mean. It should mean ain't done. Because the story continues on through your life and for my life. The, 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 the law and the prophets pointed towards Jesus. And now we look back and pour, point people back to Jesus. All right. And so the story continues through you. I, I love in our text today and in Matthew 17, it's like Peter, James, and John, they don't even realize that, that they're actually a part of the new story being written, the New Testament. And that thousands of years later, we'd be reading the story of these men's lives. They became part of the story of God. And so I have this, uh, it's funny, I was uh, at, at, a, at a friend's house and I have this, this massive book, Good Lord, things huge, right? And, and so I, I got this book and I'm, I'm thumbing through this book I found and I'm in the book. I'm in the book, man. And so how cool is that? And, and here's the reality. I tell you that is to say this. You're in the story of God, that, that it's still being written today, and you get to play a part. You get to play a role in the story of God, and get this, there are no small roles in the story of God. I'm uh, just reminded of, of my mom. Hey, mom, I hope you're watching this morning. And But uh, my mom was the first to become a, a born-again Christian uh, in our family, and I can remember, like, man, like, like she was just imperfectly following Jesus just doing the best she could with what she knew. And, and, and if you were just to look from a distance, you'd say, man, that's a pretty small role in the story of God. Um, but can I tell you this? My mom was instrumental in leading me to Jesus. And now uh, I know uh, I've impacted some of your life. And all that, why? Because someone was faithful to pay, um, play their part in the role in the story of God. There are no small parts uh, in God's story. And, and, and I love this. It references Moses and Elijah. And if you're familiar with their life, like, uh, like Moses, it was said of Moses that Moses was a friend of God. 
Exodus uh, chapter 33, verse 11, it says that thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. So uh, b- uh, this is uh, back in time here, 2001, I was, I was playing for the Atlanta Thrashers and uh, we actually shared a weight room with the basketball team, the, the Atlanta Hawks and um, the, the LA Lakers were in town. This is, this is the LA Lakers with Shaq and Kobe winning titles. This isn't fat, overweight Papa John's Shaquille O'Neal. This is slamming down dunks, owning the paint, and, and winning trophies. Uh, that Shaquille O'Neal. And I remember I, I went into the the Hawks in our, our weight room, and as I'm in there, I just was gonna work out a little bit. And who do I see? Shaquille O'Neal is in there. I'm like, this is crazy, man. I do the handshake bump thing with him. I, I come, I came up to a, a, about his the the nipples on his chest, <laughs> and so so I, I'm in there, and, and Shaq's and immediately I could tell he's annoyed, and and he just kind of left. I actually wound up working out with his bodyguard uh, in there, but I sell that to say this. If, if I was to bump into Shaquille O'Neal today, today and be like, Shaquille, remember me, bro? Atlanta, 2001, right? He'd be like, I have no idea who you are. And it would, how, how a d- disillusion or a delusional would I be if I'd be like, yeah, me and Shaq are boys. We're friends. This is not true. Why? Because, because friendship occurs over time and you spend time and you get to know the deep parts of one another. And so, um, are you a friend of God? Like, like, do you spend time with God and, and you work on your relationship going deep with him? I know uh, uh, some of us, man, we're, we're not a friend of God. We're fans of God. We're fans of God. And, and I thought I would, I would share uh, this way. COVID has been horrible for me uh, because here's what happens. People are at home uh, and they had uh, during quarantine and whatnot. And so um, uh, they have a lot more time on their hands. And so what they'll do is uh, this stack of, of letters this, this is um, fan mail, okay? And it's not fan as a preacher, <laughs> but it was fan from, from way back in the day when I used to play hockey, and these guys will, will send in these cards. And I can tell you what each and every piece of fan mail here says without even opening it. It's going to be like, uh, oh, you are amazing, you are this, blah, 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 blah. Sign my card. So, so you're just going to say like a, a lot of just kind of blow and smoke. And then they say, please sign my card and send it back to me. And, and if we're honest, I think many of us, that's our prayer life in our relationship with God. God, blah, 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 blah. Give me this. And listen, I, I don't think it's wrong to ask God for things. He says to ask, seek and knock. But if that's all you do is seek the hand of God and not the face of God, something's wrong. Moses, he sought the face of God. You know, he goes on in Exodus 33, 13. He just blurts out, God, show me your ways uh, that I might know you and find favor in your sight. He'll go on and say this, God, show me your glory. Like, show me the insides of who you really are. And so, uh, are you a friend of God? Here's another one. The the other character, uh, Elijah. And and we see Elijah. Elijah knew about the high places with God. But do you know what else? He also knew the depth and despair of the wilderness. You know, it's amazing. You read about the wilderness or the desert uh, often in the Bible. Do you know the, the word for wilderness? It, it's the word uh, uh, midbar. And, and midbar, the, the root of that word is the word devar, and, and it means to speak. And isn't it amazing that how often in our wilderness seasons that it's there that we get to hear God speaks to our life. Do you know, um, like, like there's a, a ton of the heroes of our faith that have had wilderness seasons, dark seasons of depression and despair. Uh, I can name you a few. C.S. Lewis, I quote him every week, right? Charles Spurgeon, uh, Martin Luther, the great Protestant, uh, uh, reformer, and as well, Dr. Martin Luther King, that, that these, these great men, they struggled with seasons of depression, uh, a wilderness season, as did the prophet Elijah. But Elijah knew high moments too, because in 1 Kings 18, we read about this epic moment where um, that Israel had fallen deep into idolatry under the, the rulership of King uh, uh, Ahaz and Jezebel, Ahab and Jezebel. And so um, finally, Elijah calls for this epic battle up on Mount Carmel. It's, it's the prophets of Baal versus Elijah and, and Jehovah God. And what happens on Mount Carmel, uh, the 450 prophets of Baal, they're unable to call down fire and consume the sacrifice. 
But Elijah gets up, calls down fire. God responds in power. And suddenly there's a, the tide is turned in Israel. And if it didn't get any better, it crescendos with, with actually, actually there was a three year drought. And what happens? Elijah prays fervently to the Lord and what that suddenly the rain comes pouring down. And so there's this high moment in the life of Elijah. And here's what's crazy. You turn one page more in first Kings 19 and suddenly his whole world starts to unravel. That, that Queen Jezebel sends out a holy hit, uh, or an unholy hit on the life of Elijah uh, and calls it to, to kill him. And so he runs in despair and he begins to run away. And, and actually the text actually reads that he starts, he begins to uh, go, go south. Uh, uh, through Israel and he gets as far south as he could go uh, uh, while still remaining in Jewish territory. And so it's the sense of going downward. And then what does Elijah do? In his darkness, in his depression, uh, he makes some fatal mistakes. And I think some of us do this. The first thing he does is he isolates. He, he has his servant leave him and he runs away and suddenly he isolates on his own. You do know that the enemy like uses that. He isolates uh, so he can decimate. And so um, don't isolate. You have to invite others in to help carry your burden, to help speak light into darkness. And so he does that. And, and then he makes the other fatal flaw where he just begins to replay over and over and over again all that's wrong in his life rather than searching for and fighting for the good until finally he prays the prayer that I'm sure uh, some of us have prayed. He just prays, God, just kill me. Just kill me. And so there's this dark moment, but Elijah knew if he could just get to Mount Horeb, or it's also known as Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, it's there that he can get to the high places and find perspective. So, uh, I, I've, I've made it no secret. I love those discovery, uh, planet shows, you know, with like nature. And I'm, I'm just always just blown away about the creativity and the brilliance of God and his creation. And I was watching this discovery planet. And, and for the record, the narrator, I think I could just re- hear him, uh, read the, from the phone book and it would be amazing, right? That English accent. And so I wanted to show you a clip of this, this video of these, these like little uh, baby mountain goats. Uh, I can't remember what they, they, the technical name for them is, but, but how they're able to, to ride and, and move in the mountain. And so uh, I brought a little clip of it for you this morning. Why don't you check it out? Trailing behind the last youngster is almost down and runs right into trouble. A fox. It's been waiting for the straggler. The kid has never seen a fox before, but knows it's in real peril. It appears to be running into more trouble as it heads back up the cliff. The fox tries to gain the higher ground. But the kid has found safety on a face so steep that only an ibex could stand there. The lessons learnt on this morning's descent have saved its life. Finally, the fox gives it up as a bad job. Perhaps suddenly aware it's standing on a precipice. Despite its tender age, the ibex has outwitted 
one of the canniest of predators. Come on, was that staggering to see just how, how, man, that thing could just maneuver and navigate up through the mountain? And, and I say that to say this, is that, that there was a, another prophet in a dark place, the, the prophet Habakkuk. And he was in this dark moment, but he was able to cut through the darkness and, until he found a song down in his soul. And he says this in Habakkuk 3.19. Uh, he says this, God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. Like, did you get that? Like that baby deer, man, though the enemy is wanting to take you out, that you can go to the high places, that, that you can learn to maneuver to the high places with God and you find refuge and you find strength. And do you know that the, the, the name Habakkuk, it, it means to embrace or to wrestle. And it's in the dark moments that we need to get to the high place and we embrace and we grab hold of Jesus. Um, you know, there was a, there was another man, a wrestler in the scriptures. Uh, his name was Jacob. And in Jacob, if you remember, there's this fascinating scene where it says that Jacob wrestled with God. And, and theologians have always been like baffled by this, this certain scene. But, but, but here's what I uh, jumped out at me, uh, the other day is that it references that they re- wrestled, uh, at the ford of the Jabbok. And, and here's what you need to know is the ford of the Jabbok, it's about 24 miles from the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea, the lowest place on the planet, the very bottom of planet Earth is the Dead Sea. And it is in that place that Jacob wrestled with God. And he was able to take that moment and God blessed him. And he renamed, he renamed Jacob. He says, no longer are you Jacob. You are Israel. That became the catapult moment from the lowest point that as he embraced God, what happened? Uh, he blessed and he was never the same. Uh, I think about uh, uh, J.K. Rowling, which I guess is appropriate as we're, uh, it's October 31st and the author of the Harry Potter movies, uh, you know, her, she had a, a very difficult past that she was, she was unemployed, single mom, didn't know how she was going to care for her kid. And I love her quote. She says this, that rock bottom became the solid foundation to rebuild my life. You got to grab a hold of Jesus. And so Elijah, he, he gets there, uh, to Mount, to Mount, uh, Sinai. And as he goes up Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, and as he's up there, um, there, there's this classic scene where, where suddenly we see this mighty wind, but it says that God wasn't in the wind. And then we see just this, this fire, uh, great fire thrown from heaven, but it says that God, he wasn't in the fire. And then this great quake, that the war, the earth began to shake, but it says that God wasn't in the shaking and the quaking. But then Elijah heard a still small voice, a whisper, and it was said that it was God was actually in the whisper. And here's what I want to highlight. If you're in a dark space this morning, um, I mean, I pray that God gives you ears to hear uh, the whisper in the wilderness. Do you know what? That you can only hear the whisper when you're near. Isn't that true? And God is near to you today. Do you know that, that you can, you can, you only whisper to somebody when you're intimate with them? Like, like if, if I don't know you and suddenly I get up in your ear and I start whispering, you're going to think I'm weird or maybe even punch me in the face, right? But, but, but if I'm, if you know somebody, it's appropriate to get close and to whisper in their ear. And so Elijah, he found Almighty God in the whisper. And so I pray that God would give you ears to hear the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. I, I found this really cool video on TikTok, and it's the story of this, this young boy, Christopher, who was born deaf, and, and he had um, uh, these implants into his ear, and now he's flanked by his mom and dad, and it's for the first time ever they're going to turn on the implants, and, and they, they want you to, the parents to see his, their son's face uh, the, the first time that he can hear. And so uh, check out the video. When I say go, they'll both be on together, okay? So, do so you want to watch his face? Yeah. And it's going to be on in three, two, 
See, um, wasn't that a powerful uh, little TikTok video? Like I started bawling so fast. It was crazy. Why? Uh, because to, to suddenly hear the whisper of God is unbelievably powerful. And so uh, back to our story in Matthew 17, that, that the disciples, they're terrified. They're afraid as they heard the thunderous voice of God. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. And, and as they're quivering, the, the Bible says they're face down in the earth, that suddenly they hear the whisper of Jesus. And Jesus says this, Arise and do not be afraid. And that's a word for some of you this morning. Arise, be not afraid. And when they heard the whisper of Jesus, it says they looked up and uh, all they saw was the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that over you today. Father, we just thank you for this time that we can gather together in your name. Lord, 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 I just want to just pray, God. I pray for those that are stuck this morning. God, I'm, I'm asking that, that as Jesus was transformed, Lord, I pray that there would be a, a breakthrough moment. God, that, that we would have ears to hear uh, what you're doing in our life. Lord, that we'd be drawn in to the high places with you. And God, we would have the courage and the strength by the Spirit to lay down our yes. And so we thank you and we trust you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Well, listen, the sermon's over, but we're not quite finished. As, as I need to remind you that you can remain faithful in your tithing and your giving. Um, uh, listen, we believe that the tithe or a tenth of everything that comes in, it belongs to Jesus. And, and God is accomplishing so many things in and through uh, the tithe that he's helping push out the gospel um, um, that you know this, that he's, he's helping us, um, from loving money, uh, and using people. Uh, do you know that you're supposed to use money and love people? And as we give to him, uh, we're, we're guarding our heart. Um, do you know that as well? That, that when we give back to God, it, it's actually a form of worship. I mean, the word, uh, worship, the etymology is that it's worth ship. And so, so we're actually, we bless God with our finances. And here's the great news is that as we do that, God is faithful to bless us right back. And so there's three ways that you can give. You can go to our website, encnj.org, and just hit the giving icon. Uh, or you can give via text. My family and I, we give this way, and you just text the letters ENCNJ to the number 77977. Uh, it's unbelievably convenient. Uh, or you can mail in your tither offering right here to our church at 101 Gibraltar Drive here in Morris Plains, New Jersey. And may God richly bless you as you give. And, and finally, um, if you need further prayer or you just have maybe have some questions about the church or need some counsel, uh, uh, every Sunday at 11 a.m. we have a virtual Zoom ministry. Uh, the number should be coming up on your screen. Uh, we have a pastor or a staff member available on this call to minister to your needs. Listen, every nation, God bless you. God loves you and has a great plan for your life. Have a great week.